Okay. Um, so, <coughs> yes, I think it's really interesting. I mean, um, Ulrike said this morning that in, in some respect, uh, when you looked at sort of developments in the European Union and how science society issues evolved, at some point, uh, economics was sort of, you said, sandwiched in between science and society. And I think, um, although I think when we started to think about our uh, project, we still worked, I think, within a, within a science and society type thinking. But uh, once we got the funding, the economics sandwiched itself uh, more and more into our project, I think, and we have to take more and more into account what the market is actually doing, not to, only to our project, uh, or how we think about our project, but in general about science and society. So, um, in a way, I think the market has already changed our project quite substantially in our thinking about what we have to do. So, yeah. Um, so, I just want to open up the, the discussion, um, and I just want to say that I'm glad that the market now made a, a big entry in the last uh, round, yeah. in a way. <laughs> okay, sorry. Can I just yep. say... Uh, but what, I was, what I'm missing then, if we take the kind of market thing seriously, is actually uh, we're concerned about communicating the sciences, and apparently this means the natural sciences, of course, because the English term has that in ah, it. Yes. The problem is that if you look at the economic crisis, much of the problem comes from the social sciences and the modeling they have been doing uh, in society. We have never had any concern about communicating that. What do you know about the models that drive our economy? So in itself, it's an interesting question that this is completely opaque, has never been debated carefully about, there has never been a deliberation about it, there has never been a focus group, uh, a what citizen conference or whatsoever about economic models. Yeah. And these do shape our societies in the most fundamental terms, more than the Big Bang or whatever other explanation we have about the biology or so ever. So I think here is a fundamental difference built into this idea of what social sciences do versus what natural sciences do. And of course they are they are less sexy to to present to the public in a sense like I mean we had summer students a, a kind of anecdote. We had a summer student and the question was what do we allow them to do? So I phoned up my colleague from the biology lab and I said, you have also from the same program summer students, what do you make them do? And they told me they just do pipetting. I don't know how, is that right? Yeah, yeah okay. And that, they love that. And I said, so I let them photocopy? Is that the equivalent to pipetting? Do they think that they do re relevant social science work? So I think there is a problem here, and I think we have to address that. How do we talk about social science? Yes, I think Alice and then Phil, oh, sorry. <laughs> and then I think you could all join this one. This is quick, it's just that this is the classic critique of the popularisation of science movement, particularly in the UK, is that it's all designed in order to distract you from politics. That you, the Wellcome Trust gives you these beautiful little pictures of the brain that you have a, an emotional experience of and you don't question their funding models or you don't have conversations about the politics of it. You know, they will do all this stuff about, oh, we'll talk about bioethics and stuff, but you're not talking about the economics of it. And that's why the last thing you're going to, this is me being very cynical, I don't know if I believe this or not, but the last thing you're ever going to see is public engagement work that looks at public engagement with research funding. Because the res public engagement, with, because um, research funding of science is one of the most dramatic and potentially disruptive political things you can do. And so all the popularisation, the isn't this wonderful Brian Cox stuff, is a beautiful distraction. That's... Yeah, yeah. Provocation, you can react. I mean, Phil, Yeah, I just let it pass. Um, I would love to disconnect physicists and physical scientists entirely from the economic crisis, but in terms of our graduates, an awful lot of our graduates went into the city, so some of those economic models are a fault. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so I want to preface what I'm saying by um, sort of making a comment about the program. I think one of the strengths of the, the, um, the Leave You program, uh, or the team, I suppose, is that actually we all come from uh, quite different dis disciplines. Um, and so part of what we find important is actually even the kind of internal process of engagement. But for me, one thing that's really striking and which has come up a lot this afternoon is this idea that there's something called making science public. 
And there's something else about tackling economics, markets, uh, the role of markets in science, uh, and the neglect of uh, you know wider issues to do with social justice e inequality and so forth. And I think Brigitte was saying that you know the market is becoming more important. But what I really absolutely want to underline is that making science public in the sense that STS or science technology studies uh, have been uh, looking at it for at least 20 years has always had the market in it. Um, I mean, if you you just have to look at, for example, the most uh, the standard kind of STS response uh, of understanding the GM controversy, um, if I can quote Brian Wynn, you know, the point has always, that he's always made is that if you look at uh, public responses, some of them are about concerns to do with research funding, innovation, uh, the role of uh, commercial uh, of, of companies and so on and so forth. So that's just one example, but this idea that the market or economics is sort of separate from making science public, I think is a bit of a fallacy. And part of, I mean, certainly what I'd like to see is uh, more of those issues actually coming to the fore, possibly. I mean, it has to be worked for uh, in this kind of making science public process in this investigation. So I think those two things are quite intimately uh, connected. That's part of, I mean, going back to Paul's point, that's part of the politics of science as well, as you described. There was somebody over there. Is there somebody over there? Ah, Hi, Sarah Hartley, I'm one of the research fellows on this Neverhood project. Um, I just want to also uh, pick up on Paul Martin's point um, and look at um, making science public through a political lens again, or from a uh, political science perspective. Um, and we saw after lunch uh, a session on the practice of making public science, but that is essentially uh, about science communication, communicating with the public, which um, from a political science perspective, is really adhering to the uh, democratic deficit model. Uh, what we want to see, and what I understand anyway, the practice of making public science, uh, making science public, is giving the public a chance to shape science, getting the public uh, looking at the public value of science, and trying to have a, a, a discussion about the democratization of science, rather than going back to well, let's just have some have, get the public in our labs or let's talk to the public about how exciting science is. This is almost the promotion of science. Uh, yes, it increases public understanding of science in the sense that, that they may have an understanding of how a laboratory works or uh, they can watch videos and understand some uh, uh, difficult concepts of science. But I'm not sure that's what I would interpret about um, the, the, the idea of making uh, science public. I just wondered if any of the panel wanted to comment on that. It's a, an intriguing one because, and I've debated with some people about double data, some of you might know about this idea of democratization of science. Um, let's say I get a grant um, in fluid dynamics. I'm a physicist, that's roughly in the general area of physics. I send that grant back because I'm not an expert and I would not trust my opinions on that particular area of science. I'm, I'm taking a very niche example just to, to sort of try and tease out some of the difficulties here, because there has to be some element of expert opinion driving this process. There has to be some element of expertise, because how does science progress? And if we are going to let the public or the publics drive that process, at what level does that happen? And how do we steer that on a day-to-day -day basis? That would be my question. And if the argument is that we do democratise um, science in that way, what is the role of expert knowledge then? I should have said earlier on that I was initially trained as a scientist, as a molecular biologist, and did postgraduate research. So, so you know, it's a case of uh, gamekeeper turned hunter or the other way around, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. So, um, I mean, I think that's right, absolutely. But I don't think, well, there's, there's two answers to this. I'd say, in terms of the politics of science, this is really about societal choices, about the allocation of resources and legitimacy and power and those sorts of things, at a, for me at least at a more strategic level. So we clearly have major debates, political debates, about health policy, about housing policy, about transport policy. 
but really we very rarely have political debates about the allocation of resources with relationship to science. Science is, in some sense, is a protected domain as a regime of expertise. Hold it. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think, you know, the, the, uh, and, in, and in some senses, I don't want to completely undermine that protected domain either when I think about how we might think about a different type of democratic politi politics of science. I'm not advocating that we should have panels of lay publics uh, setting your grants or anything like that. But, that would be crazy. But the research councils have stipulated in the past that you should have a user representative on panels to comment on, for example, economic impact. Yes, I, but that's, that's the impact agenda, that's the knowledge well, it's agenda. Effort, all in, in 1995, when I put in my first year's RC grant, I had to have a user person uh, on it. Uh, I was doing metaphor research and I had to grapple for somebody uh, and I got a teacher to say oh, metaphors are nice. But anyway, yes. Uh, <laughs> but, 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 it's, but it's interesting, can I just give one little, ex one li one little example? There's a, there's, a, there's a translational neuroscience research centre in Sheffield that's it's quite interesting. It's semi, partly funded largely by philanthropy, actually, plus some support from the university, plus the charitable sector, and a bit of private money. And it's quite. And the woman who set it up is quite visionary in terms of having a whole set of stakeholders associated with it. Because it's philanthropic led, it had, has very much a sort of. It's about uh, neuroscience where there's essentially market failure of a large pharmaceutical companies have disinvested almost entirely from that area. So it falls on the private, uh, the private foundations and, and, and people who, who donate the charitably to sort of fill the gap. But there they have users or you know, people who are affected by neurodegenerative diseases involved in some of the governance of the centre. They don't interfere with the science as such, but they will have quite a say in terms of some of these strategic choices being made. So I think it's possible to, to, to square that circle of actually having some types of participation, I'm not holding this up as a, a great model, I don't know enough about it, but it's possible to have some types of models of participation at a more grounded laboratory or institutional level that I think can enrich the practices of science, can actually help in the sort of steering and addressing of these questions of social need, because clearly this is in the, in the, in the neurodegenerative mm -hmm. areas, that's where there, there is market failure and social need can be, it's a legitimate issue. So I think you know, I wouldn't just say it's purely the strategic. I think we have to be clever, we have to be smart, we have to be innovative about trying to think about how we can create new forms of democratic participation, uh, but without, you know, without sort of completely compromising those issues of expertise. I think Ryan, I wanted to say something, and I, right. I don't want to include the general. I just wanted to <coughs> comment on the um, problem of publics and the role of media, because I, th I don't know how much you will be looking at that in the project, but it seems to me that publics are increasingly mediated. So what we, when we uh, discussed the question of Ricky brought up, why didn't anyone scrutinize the models? Uh, the first answer would be because the media doesn't pay attention to it. So I've come across some of the research in, in that area about media practice and it seems to be that if you look at the economics, journalists are usually a service provider uh, for the market economy. They, are, they have been captured, to put it bluntly. The same applies to environmental journalists. So they are uh, crusaders for a case in both, in both areas. This doesn't apply to politics because of the nature of the beast, which is an agonistic field and you have many parties and people don't get away with just celebrating one side because they will be attacked by others. So the question is empirically, what, what do we know about science journalism? Is there a capture process or not? Um, and um, of course the implication would be we should have uh, coverage of these practices, first of all, uh, through the media, mass media and social media, uh, talking about the issues that we are raising today. Uh, and just as an add-on, I don't think it's that easy to say because the economic models were wrong, we went into the financial crisis, because that would be the linear model in reverse, you know, blaming something uh, on the models. It's always p political decisions and the lack, lack of political prudence or whatever you call it. Uh, is a more uh, likely cause, I guess, than the faulty uh, economic models. Nobody wanted to believe that they are wrong. There were war warning voices all the way, but people didn't want to listen. Well, I think we've got to be careful of talking about the whole of science or the whole of the public mm -hmm. or anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you end up doing that inevitably, but I just, maybe partly to 
um, to say that I, I think we should think about uh, to, counter, to um, respond to one of the things that Philip said that we maybe need to think about how uh, public participation works in different areas of science. So the example you gave with biomedicine, and that's maybe very different from fluid dynamics. Mm, of course. And, um, and so maybe we shouldn't have the same expectations for someone who works in one area of physics to something in biomedicine. Um, but there are, can, to add on to that, you can have forms of public participation which are done to defend and celebrate expertise. In fact, we might critique that, actually, as being problematic, or we might celebrate it, depending on, or we might just study it. Um, what, one good example is some of the activism around the bad science blogs and some of the work that Ben Goldacre has done, which also responds to the point you made about capture of science journalists, or journalism in particular, is that blogging field, they're interesting and weird, um, but you know, they do all sorts of stuff that are disrupting that. And sometimes actually publicly funded, because a lot of the science bloggers are professional scientists doing this as part of their public engagement work, um, but are, are then um, collecting publics and forms of public participation in order to, to support and celebrate areas of expertise and maybe sell, um, support David Nutt or something like that. Um, so we shouldn't just think about public participation as being something that's designed through um, something that's come out of the sociology department. It's more complicated than that. So I just want to um, invite Lee to elaborate a little bit on your comment about humanising science. Uh, I just wonder whether, for example, to, is that equivalent to democratising science or uh, ensuring that ethics are, are properly developed and policed within science or is there something else that you have in mind when you talk about humanising science? And is there something then different about why science needs to be humanised differently than, let's say, other social institutions? Politics. Football, dare I say it? <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by humanising science? Um, a, a number of things. Thank you for asking me that. Um, let's just take some of the images. Uh, I, I spoke to the British Society of Gene Therapy a few years ago. It was their after dinner speaker. And it wasn't meant to be all fun. It was a serious lecture. Um, and, and what I've done is some research on Hollywood movies. And the Hollywood movies showed some interesting facets of how scientists who worked in gene therapy were regarded. And they were either um, brilliant but flawed, immoral and evil, or just mad. And people recognised this. And there, is, there are some... We're talking about a whole range of science, but just to sort of the biotechnology interest industry and some medical applications are ones where um, people are, are naturally nervous about what might be done next. And then in, yeah, I remember uh, a lecture, I don't remember, I wasn't there, it was a while ago, but Sir George Porter, who was the president of the Royal Society, and a chemist spoke to the Royal Society and said, he gave the scientists then, in the 70s, a warning because he said, I think we're having a bad impact on people's psyches. And I think it was replayed again with Professor, uh, Professor Brian Clotz. He might get Sir at some point. <laughs> He's a wonderful communicator. But he did his Wonders of the Universe and uh, it all looked fantastic and there was just a flood of emails saying, you know, I nearly slashed my wrists because he'd forgotten something about hope. And in saying the universe will go out in however many billion, trillion years, that affected people's psyches. I think there is something that scientists just don't log on to always about the impact of their, their data. That's a specific... Um, issue for certain kinds of science. I think the same is the blind chance of um, natural selection and things like that has impacts on people. We also um, live in a world where we're giving mixed messages all the time and I, I wonder whether it's almost like people have a bit of a schizophrenia between their heads and their hearts about science. I mean this is just, I float this out for you that they love science and they love what it does, they love technology, let's get this right, they love what it does, like iPads and everything like that. But there's also something going on that is making them wonder whether there is more to life. 
And science is brilliant at breaking things down, at taking things apart. Um, I'm a member of the HFEA recently, and you know when you look at what's happened to our understanding of parenthood since it was possible to do IVF, it's had m amazingly good impacts, but it's also had some, it's, it's actually disassociated things which were always held together. So those are kind of aspects that I think are playing around in the national psyche and perhaps in other places which disturb that relationship with science. Science should be a blessing to society. Um, you know, I think it's a gift, but it obviously gets abused or the way it's presented sometimes doesn't help us. It's gone very quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I suppose you all read there was an article in the, was it the Observer about humanizing, uh, I mean, about in science, scientists and emotions on Sunday. No, um, no, I didn't miss that. Oh, I missed yes, they, they interviewed um, I don't know, four scientists who <coughs> told about the, the joy or the pleasure they had in discovering, Again. making a breakthrough, yeah. others had some sorrows, I mean, like we heard from, from Brady today. Uh, and that actually generated, again, quite a lot of tweets and emails and, and, and discussion about um, why, is, uh, why is this actually necessary? But um, I mean, to come back to, I mean, you said something about the, was it the emails, the planet emails? So um, th this humanizing of science, I don't know. Uh, that, how much do you want to intrude in scientists? Look, I, I, was, I don't know. Uh, I was fascinated. That's, that's sort of like yin and the yang. I mean. <laughs> yeah, but I was fascinated <laughs> by the conversation yeah. about the the coffee room earlier, and I, I, I don't know whether I fully followed what was being said, but it was um, we don't have the conversation; and it has to be written down in books. No, no, no. I, I mean, the, I think the issue was that if you open up the coffee room conversations to say live cameras, <laughs> then <laughs> that might then close down the discussion yeah. <laughs> so the opening up needs to close it down and I think with the opening up of emotions it, it, I think it's really necessary actually because it you, you don't but because perhaps in these films you're talking about there are these stereotypes which need actually to be destroyed they're out, they're out there and I think it's just important to own what goes on <laughs> But yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a big issue, I think. Yeah, okay. I think. Uh, maybe sociologists could be useful in uh, relaying what the, emotion, what, the, what the real emotions of scientists are, like that point about uh, performing earlier. And one of, the really interesting thing, one of the most interesting things that Brian Cox has done that people don't always talk about in recent years is his role as a scientific advisor on the film Sunshine. So there's a lot of work that's been done get, encouraging scientists to work with uh, people in Hollywood so that they have scientific accuracy. David Kirby has written a brilliant book about this. If you ever uh, Google that, you'll find it. Um, but one of the really interesting uh, things that Brian Cox has done that very few other scientists have done in that is that he was involved in the movie Sunshine not just to say this is what physics does these are the laws of physics let's make sure you get it accurate mm. but, but to relay an idea of what a scientist is and what it's like if you watch that movie it's very like a, a Brian Cox performance of what science is it's similar to his documentaries because I think this is genuinely how he feels this is how he feels he wants to share science but that is just one form of emotion that a scientist might have there are many that many other scientists will have at different points in their careers or may choose to sometimes deny when they're having a public face and sociologists of science, you know, their expertise is seeing things that scientists don't always see about themselves and showing the diversity of science, not just those that choose to be to perform, um, those that are powerful enough to be performed. Um, and so maybe, maybe we need uh, more sociology of science involved in the filmmaking and fiction making production rather than just the scientists. Can I just make an addendum on my point about humanising? Because uh, uh, Ian McEwan's book, Solar, is a very interesting exploration of both an environmental crisis, the role of science and technology to save humanity, and the very flawed or real nature of human character, depending on how you understand human character. Uh, and, and I think McEwen plays that tension very interestingly in the novel, um, which is quite a good site to explore with students, the relationships between science, humanity, and salvation. I, I've certainly used it in my class quite interestingly. No, I think uh, novels deserve uh, more. Um. <laughs>
said back to Ulrika's talk this morning. So Sajati, you said that um, in SDS for the past at least two decades or more, um, lots of people have been talking about the market. And I definitely agree with you, um, particularly if we look more, you know, even more broader than the market. So the idea of economic logic and how that's talked about in STS. And I guess um, I completely agree that that's what lots of STS scholars um, have been talking about. And how I wanted to link it to Ulrike, you said, I think, um, you talked about an EU level, how certain ideas in STS have been taken up and others ignored. So I suppose it's a really simple point, but maybe that explains why it is that some of us feel like we're having to say, say the same thing. Again, it's to do with the politics of, of how STS is being taken up which explains why um, we're continually making the same points. Or maybe, this is a bit of a stretch, maybe it links to the medialisation of research that Ulrika was talking about. So um, I think, Ulrika, in your talk, you focused on, or I understood it as more in terms of natural scientists, and I know we've touched on throughout the days, what does that mean for social scientists? But maybe, and I know this isn't about blame, but maybe we're also guilty if we're trying to be medialised or... Um, then are we pushing certain of our ideas forward and ignoring some of those those ideas? So, thanks. Oh yes, I think we have to sort of slow things down. Then, and then Alison, and then I think uh, I do two sentences summing up. <laughs> yep. Just and to push that a little further, um, and the bully's point about the social sciences with, and, and the natural sciences and engineering, there's a, a important structural inequality between the social sciences and the natural sciences and engineering. If you go back to uh, Langdon Winner uh, in Autonomous Technology, he doesn't just analogize, but he equates uh, technological innovation and legislation. And so if one wants to extend that to the sort of disciplinary areas of the natural sciences and their impact in technological innovation and legislation as an idea of impact of the social sciences, uh, at least in the United States, but also elsewhere in the connection of the, the, the market economy, there are a whole host of incentives, uh, some of which are publicly provided, for natural scientists and engineers to take their uh, to take their innovative enterprise to market and change the world in that way, regardless of uh, basically the consent of the governed. Uh, whereas those a whole host of things do not exist for social scientists and humanists. Uh, and in fact, we would be engaged in significant conflicts of interest and breach of public trust if we in fact engaged in those same kinds of behaviors. I collect these t last two things then if there are any responses. So Alison and then gentlemen up there and then I think <coughs> we can respond to all three, I think. Okay? Yep. So. Uh, Alison Moore, I'm one of the project leaders, um, but my project hasn't started yet. But it revo um, revolves around some of the issues that we've been touching on today, uh, which emerged, I think, um, starting with a question that Roland put forward and Sajata uh, then commented on. And this is, um, I think, the need for us as social scientists, and particularly within this program itself, to be more reflexive. So to, we've been talking a lot about the politics of, of science uh, and Paul draw our attention to the importance of drawing it back to um, politics itself and, and a democratic politics. But I think we need to take a step um, further back or even closer to ourselves, I suppose, in some sense, uh, in looking at our own role uh, in, um, in turning a critical lens on our own role in the politics of making science public. And I think we need to make that more explicit in the context of this particular program. Because um, we're very good at critiquing and shaping these debates uh, in particular ways. And then we put those sort of critiques out there, usually in the form of academic publications or in playing the social science expert in a, a public deliberation exercise or something like that. But, um, but taking on Roland's point, I think we need to engage more in these debates. So we need to put ourselves out there front and center uh, and talk face to face with people 
and there are quite clearly some issues, some of them as simple as uh, issues about language and understanding concepts uh, in different ways and trying to break those things down. So it's not going to be easy, but these are very important steps that um, we should take and in, in some sense that's our own democratic challenge. And something which my project partly addresses in looking at social scientists as intermediaries in these sorts of debates. But I'd like to, well, I hope that we have a broader vision within the program in trying to understand that uh, amongst all the projects. Okay. Well, that's the last one. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, going back to the issue of humanising science and, and to the reaction that people apparently had to uh, the work that Brian Cox did on TV. Um, there's no doubt, I definitely agree, that scientists should consider the reaction that the public will have to the research that they're doing, to the data that they're collecting, to the repercussion that will have on the life of society as a whole. But um, this is just a slight personal worry of mine. Um, I think there's a, a danger. It certainly opens up to a potentially slippery slope. Uh, we're in the solutions that might be proposed in the future might be to somehow sugarcoat the truth when it's being communicated to the public. And that, I think that would be a sort of demeaning of science as an enterprise. I think the crucial point of uh, opening science to the public should also be, and I don't mean to be brush, uh, should, should, should be to allow the public to understand that in many ways, reality has no obligation to be pleasing to us, and that we have to accept the consequences of research, whether we like it or not. Just that. Thank you. Are there any reactions to these three points? Ah, oh, just, just, just very briefly, or whatever. I mean, I was just struck by the fact, or uh, well, thinking it's an obvious point, really, but science and technology are really about hope and progress. You know, if we think about the types of futures we imagine. Uh, the types of imaginaries we're constructing in the, de in the realms of science and technology. And so I think it's very difficult for scientists in the public domain to, if, that, if that's the case, to somehow talk about other types of narratives. Maybe in respect to climate science, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a broader vision of, well, we can save the world, we can save ourselves in terms of the apocalyptic sort of side of things. But in the main, science I think is often associated with these notions of progress. And interestingly, I think social scientists are about criticism and reflection. Uh, they're not about those sorts of positive things in the public imagination. They're much more problematic. I'm not saying they, they don't have um, positive aspects to them. But I think there's something about those broader constructions and the relationship to the future, these re relationships of science and technology to analysis of progress that I think are really central here and why actually it's problematic uh, to have anything other than narratives of hope and progress in the public domain. Okay. Well, we can. I think you will be the last person. Oh. You were the speakers. <laughs> okay. Well. Maybe just shortly, what we did not touch actually, which ties together some of these comments, is actually that in in this last European kind of uh, programmatic statement, the, the issue of social innovation has come up very strongly, and I think it will be interesting to think about how do we fill that notion with some meaning and how that relates to what we think about technological innovations and how they tie together and things like that. And I think there is a, a room that can be inhabited in a sense and, and kind of taken over. And I think taken over not in the sense of possessing it, but in the sense of contributing uh, to it. And I think there is, I see, I see potential uh, because it's actually a space that is not really occupied by anything. It's just there as a kind of admitting of the incapa incapacity of, techno of techno-scientific innovations to come up with solutions that kind of answer the challenges we are in. And so I think that might be a way of, of binding what is being thought in this area also into, th into thinking like what would it mean a different form of collaboration and, and co-thinking maybe more than kind of structures of influence and decision making and choice. And that's what I was meaning when I was saying it's about care in the sense of that it's maybe not about lay people deciding which physics project is going to be decided or funded or not, but it's more about really 
thinking where do the big developments go, where do we invest, and, and how, what does that have as a kind of value behind it? And I think there, is some issue, there are some issues to be thought about. Okay. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for <laughs> contributing so lively and <laughs> Oh, two sentences. I mean, uh, this, this morning I said that I would like to get your interpretations of the title Making Science Public. And I think, in a way, we have done a lot of that job during the day. And I've written down a few of these. So, making scientists public. I think that's an, an issue. What, what's the difference between making science public and making scientists public? Making science in public, making science by the public, making science private making science in different countries, and I think that's really interesting. I think we, we should look at this comparative dimension a bit more. Uh, making publics just. Making STS public. Now, that is a challenge. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, making universities, the workings of universities public. Making the politics of popularization public. And making profit public. I mean, where does the profit come from? Where does it go? How is it shared? And so on. So. Um, there are lots of, of things we could do with the title, and uh, I still want you to send me any <coughs> ideas uh, you have, or any criticisms, or any innovative uh, framings uh, by email, and we'll put it into a database which we could put, open up to you all. So anyway, um, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I think there will be some canopies or something, if I'm not completely wrong. Um, <laughs>